Welcome to Surrey and just over my shoulder down there is the proposed site of a new gas well. But is it right to be drilling for fossil fuels here or anywhere? This week in The Climate Show, we haven't come far from London, but you might not know it looking at this. Absolutely stunning, but an environment where they're thinking of drilling more oil and gas wells. Also on the programme... I speak to Net Zero Secretary Grant Shapps about why he's still backing new oil and gas and hear why he's investing in plans to beam solar power down from space. We unpack how regulations for cleaner shipping fuels could actually accelerate warming and learn how this landfill has been transformed into a biodiverse meadow. But first, this is an area where they're planning to expand fossil fuel extraction, but the two projects are facing legal challenges, one of which could have very profound implications. Rural Surrey isn't exactly where you'd expect to find an oil well, but a legal case surrounding this site at Horse Hill near Hawley could have ramifications for the future of new fossil fuel projects across the UK. So this is the planned site for the uh, extraction of oil um, on a production basis. They want ultimately seven vertical wells here. Uh And uh, this is obviously somewhere they don't really want people to look into. Surrey County Council approved the expansion of this site, but local campaigners challenged it, saying it's incompatible with the UK's climate obligations. Surrey County Council didn't consider the um, burning of the fuel when it comes out of the ground. They only considered the climate emissions of as the oils and gases are being produced and not the downstream impact of what would happen when the produced oil is actually burned when it's in engines of cars and trucks. Surrey County Council said they followed planning rules. Whether that's true will be tested in the highest court in the land next week, the Supreme Court. This is a test case because it is the first time that the Supreme Court has ever considered the issue of whether environmental impact assessment, when it comes to fossil fuel projects, needs to consider the end use emissions from those projects. This is really um, a landmark case um, and if the Supreme Court finds that Surrey County Council has acted unlawfully, um, it could have ramifications for other and much bigger fossil fuel projects. The UK's oil and gas industry is also watching closely. What would it mean if the courts decided that planners had to take into account the climate impact of a well as well as its local impact? Look at what the judge said when the initial High Court appeal was thrown out. Justice Holgate, he said uh, that the emissions associated with the combustion of the fuel are already considered by dedicated environment regimes. If the Supreme Court was to go against the previous decisions, given this would be the third Mm. time, it would have huge ramifications onshore oil and gas, offshore oil and gas and broader industry. Do you fear it would be the end of new oil and gas exploration in the UK? It would have it would be a material consideration in all planning applications. There's, there's no question of that. And another site in Surrey shows the inconsistencies in how cases like this are dealt with. Here in Dunsfold, the same company applied to drill for gas and despite planners rejecting this one, the government intervened to have that decision overturned. Activists have now taken this decision to the High Court. The Council twice refused uh, permission for this project to go ahead um, and then the Secretary of State came in and uh, overrode um, the local government's decision. That's a problem. Um, And on the very same day as the Secretary of State said that this project should go ahead, the Secretary of State decided that another very similar project shouldn't go ahead because of the fossil fuel emissions that that project would cause. UK oil and gas say exploration will last for three years, adding it will be used for hydrogen. But local residents are clear they don't want drilling in their backyard. While most of the homes here are heated with fossil fuels, we've got plenty of cars that are using uh, petrol or diesel here. Why should we demand that that fuel comes from elsewhere? So we're looking at 2030, basically, before anything's going to come out of that particular site, by which time we should be moving as a nation 
towards greener energy. So, and it's also a very small amount that they're projecting will be there. So is it worth all the disruption and the damage to the environment locally and nationally um, to extract a very small amount which won't have a significant impact on our energy supply? The campaign against further exploration in the North Sea is also gathering pace. What do we want? Climate justice. When do we want it? Now. Activists are calling for the UK to reject plans from the Norwegian oil and gas giant Equinor for Rosebank, the UK's largest unexplored oil field off the coast of Shetland. They say burning the 500 million barrels of oil from the site would generate more CO2 emissions than 28 low-income countries produce in a year. Morning. Morning. Labour recently pledged to stop new oil and gas exploration, but that's not the position of the government. Energy Security and Net Zero Secretary Grant Shapps will decide if it gets the go-ahead soon. To drill or not to drill, that's the question. Perhaps ultimately it will be the courts that help to decide the answer. Well, I'm now joined by Grant Shapps, who's Secretary of State for Energy Security and Net Zero. Do you support new oil and gas exploration in the UK? I've always said that if we're going to get to Net Zero, we have to do that as a transition to Net Zero. And that means if you just try and go from A to Z without going through that transition, you will end up in immediate trouble. By, by, by which I mean uh, we have an unrivaled, uh, unrivaled record of decarbonisation in this country. No other major economy beats us. But if we simply decided we were not going to extract any more oil and gas, we'll end up importing it instead. Yeah with twice as much carbon. We're not talking about a moratorium now. My question was, do you support new exploration for oil and gas? Oh, new, look, what I'm saying is uh, I, I have to ultimately make decisions about that transition. Even if we exploited every bit of oil and gas, we'd still have a trajectory of using 7% less each year. So, so, a yes, so this do, is a, you, this you is a yeah, new, yes, new I've, been, I've been really clear about it. We, yeah. can't, we can't dream ourselves into this, we've got to do it in a consistent way. So if we need to in order to get to net zero in a way which prevents us importing more carbon, then the answer would have to be yes. Even though the Climate Change Committee says there should be a presumption against exploration of new fossil fuel sources. Well, my, my job legally actually is to get to net zero. In, in, in fact, I have a legal duty from Parliament to, to do so. So I have to show you that... You famously I, said you might go to prison well, if you well, don't. I could be in contempt of court if I wasn't trying. So I, I, what I can tell you is I've published a plan which gets us... We've already exceeded carbon budgets one, two, three, on track for four, uh, and four, we're on track for five. Uh, and I've published my plan for six, which gets us very close, and I know there are still a few bits and pieces we need to do, but we get very close on that. Having achieved all the others, I think history is on our side that this country can do it. There's a case coming up in the Supreme Court which is asking whether planners should take into account greenhouse gas emissions when granting approval or not, when making that decision. What impact could that have if they say that we need to take into account greenhouse yeah, gas I emissions? I don't want to comment on any in particular case in front of courts for obvious sort of quasi-judicial uh, reasons uh, as uh, Secretary of State makes decisions in that area uh, and we leave it to the courts to make those decisions. What we do know is that this country, I mean, if you look at the track record, has done more than any other to decarbonise. We've gone from 40% coal 10 years ago, 12 years ago, in our electricity production, yeah. to virtually nothing now. So I am confident we can get there. I will have to take into account whatever courts decide along the way. Of it, course. it could have huge impact if they said they must take into account greenhouse gas emissions, couldn't it? Of course. And it could be very oh, of course. I mean, restrictive. It's to, say, it's to state the obvious, to say that you know we always have to make sure that we are uh, staying within the law and, uh, and adjusting to whatever's required to get there. But overall, am I confident we can get there? Yes. How do I know? Because we've been getting there all along, ahead of time, ahead of what everyone else thought was possible. We caught up with the Secretary of State at London Tech Week, where he was making an announcement on renewables from outer space. For decades, scientists have been exploring the potential for collecting the sun not on Earth, but instead in space, and then sending it somehow wirelessly down to the Earth. Space-based solar energy farms. In the hall just here, you've been talking about solar energy from space. Can you simply explain what that is? Yeah, simple. Solar panels, everyone's used to seeing them on the houses uh, and, uh, and out in the country. 
Uh, what about if you position those in space and then you beam the energy down to Earth? If you think about it, in space there's no weather to affect it, there's no uh, night and day, so you'd have 24-hour uh, sunshine, which is one of the problems with solar, that it's inconsistent. Uh, and uh, if you can develop the technology to beam it down to the Earth, well, this could be a big, very big deal indeed. How would that get down to Earth, that energy? Yes, it would use, it would use a, a form of radio waves, is the answer. Uh, and uh, it's one of the questions uh, that we'll be answering through but this. It's a huge question. I mean, I heard you say in the hall that it would get down somehow wirelessly. Yeah. Forgive me, that sounds a little bit hand well, it's One of the reasons why we have uh, the funding that I've announced today uh, going to the scientists who tell us, and have done actually, by the way, it's not a new idea. The idea has been around for decades. They tell us it's technically possible uh, and we've seen some early experiments. Uh, the university, I think, in California have recently demonstrated moving energy wirelessly. Uh, so we think it probably is possible. It's one of the reasons we're investing in it today. But there's a huge gap between technically possible and what is actually sensible for generating energy. I mean, you can make energy out of a lemon with a, you know, a couple of electrodes. It's about whether it does it enough and at a low enough price. Can you really convince me that this is ever going to be plausible as a big source of energy? I think I can. Uh, think about the history of nuclear power, fission. Uh, it was the case that many experts, actually including Einstein, said it would never be possible to produce uh, domestic energy uh, uh, using nuclear power. Of course, we now know that wasn't true. And the same will happen with solar-based uh, but, uh, but there are plenty of electricity, low carbon energy solutions down here on Earth that we know work. Onshore wind, rooftop solar, better insulation. These aren't, if you'll forgive me, half-baked pies yeah. in the sky. Yeah. These are things that could actually happen now yeah. and you're not getting behind them enough. Well, just can I just check what you've just said? Just to correct this, we have more onshore wind, I think, right now than any other form Maybe of renewables. Party put a massive but, damper but, on it but, in the but, last but we have more, but, but nonetheless, except the point, we already have more onshore wind you than more? any other form of renewable. And like we will see more? see more, and we will see more. A um, lot more? So, uh, we'll see what happens to the market, but we will see more. Offshore, as I said in my speech in there, there is no country in the world uh, other than China that has more uh, offshore wind power. In fact, we have the world's largest offshore wind far, uh, farms and the second largest, the third and fourth, you heard me said in, in my speech. And on solar, and this surprises people to hear, uh, we have as much solar power as France, even though our weather is generally not as nice as theirs, and geographically we're constrained in half of the space. So actually we do very well on our renewables. Um, one problem with renewables, commonly cited, is they're not there if the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't, uh, sun isn't is shining. Which is why And it's also why space-based power could be a very interesting idea. Yeah. Um, we're seeing sea temperatures at record highs, you know, disappearing ice in the uh, in both poles. Do you ever kind of lie awake at night thinking we're really not going fast enough? I know we're not going fast enough as a as a world um, and as a country. Uh, and as a country, I think we can hold our heads up high because when I go around the world, and I've recently uh, visited, for example, the G seven twenties, the OECD last last week. What I find is everybody is asking me, as the British Energy Security Secretary, how, do you, how are you getting to net zero so quickly? They're fascinated by our story. Partly it's by only, offshoring a lot, we get China to make a lot well, of our stuff. I was going to say, partly by <laughs> offshoring to offshore for wind, actually, in, in yeah, many ways. We, we, we measure production emissions, not consumption emissions, and we buy lots of stuff from overseas. Which is why we've said uh, and committed in the Powering Up Britain document, which is the, the, the document that I launched just a month after the department was, was created, a month and a half after. Uh, that we are, are going to consult on uh, what are called CBAMs or carbon border uh, mechanisms to uh, look at whether we are importing the carbon, which is not a, not a viable way forward. But just on your point, I want to power Britain from Britain, uh, by which I mean we've got all this opportunity for renewables, we've got all this opportunity for both nuclear and small modular uh, reactors. Uh, what I don't want to do, to return to your original question, is do something precip precipitous, which is to ban our oil, 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 uh, gas and oil and then end up importing it because all these petrol cars aren't going to disappear overnight, even though I personally set the most ambitious transition to net zero cars, to zero emission vehicles of any country in Europe. I'd love to talk to you more about electric cars. As owners of them, we love to talk about them, but that would take another whole programme. Secretary of State Grant Shapps, thank you very much indeed. And now we're off to a break. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to the show. Now, 
As much as Britain has been sweating in an early summer heat wave, high ocean temperatures have been worrying climate scientists, especially in the North Atlantic. The blue lines on this graph show the range of sea surface temperature variations for each year since the 1980s in relation to the average. But take a look at this red line. That's this year, with the last few weeks showing an enormous jump above anything else ever seen to date. Warmer oceans can supercharge our weather and lead to more extreme storms. So, what's happening here? Climate scientists say human-caused climate change is clearly the cause, with the oceans absorbing the majority of heat we've put into the atmosphere so far. But debate is also swirling around about other factors, such as a lack of Saharan dust this year. And another theory has been gaining traction too – the introduction of regulations to clean up shipping, particularly to clean up the air around them. Container ships traditionally burn a dirty form of oil called bunker fuel, which produces high levels of sulphur emissions. But that changed in 2020, with the International Maritime Organization bringing in much stricter regulations, cutting sulphur emissions by three quarters. The benefits to human health and the environment in reducing sulphur emissions from international shipping are translated into the amount of debt that actually is saved every year. 570,000 deaths would have taken place had we not taken this decision. Despite those clear benefits, sulphur emissions from shipping were actually having a cooling effect on the planet. Research shows that they create clouds and even make existing clouds more reflective, stopping some of that heat from reaching the ocean. Given most shipping takes place in the northern oceans, some scientists are now speculating that clearer skies from cleaner shipping could now be contributing to the faster warming of seas that we're seeing here. In the areas where a lot of sulfur was being emitted in the past decades over the North Atlantic, but also North Pacific Oceans, um, now when in 2020 the regulation of reducing the sulfur emissions came into effect, we see in this area that there's a lot of additional solar radiation being absorbed because there's less light being reflected back to space. That's what this NASA satellite data tell us. And that's with all this additional energy in the system, it's not surprising that this uh, is translating to uh, higher surface, sea surface temperatures. Other scientists say that while this is an active area of research, it's too early to draw those conclusions. But all agree that the clearest way to avoid the worst impacts of hotter oceans is to reduce carbon emissions and fast. In other news this week, oil giant Shell announced that it has no plans to cut oil and gas production in the years to come, as the chief executive said the company was committed to its fossil fuel division and wants to maximise shareholder returns. More than 50% of China's electricity capacity is now made of renewable sources, state media said this week, with the target reached two years ahead of schedule. Yet, despite the progress, China still draws on vast amounts of carbon-intensive coal power too. It's been a hot and dry start to the summer, meaning that destructive wildfires are breaking out already, all the way from the highlands of Scotland through to South Wales. And our science correspondent, Thomas Moore, has been out with the crews tackling the blazes and preparing for more. I'm on Regus Mountain in South Wales. Now, the wildfire has been burning here for several days. It swept through this area uh, overnight, but you can see that the vegetation, much of it is gone, it's blackened. But there are patches left which are now really dry. Uh, and a lot of this is resinous, uh, evergreen material so the danger is that this could uh, reignite there are hot spots as you can see but the priority for the fire services is the fire front which is now uh, some way from here that's where the flames are much larger the concern is that they might spread uh, to a wind farm not far away now with climate change these long dry periods 
Uh, the danger is that fires are getting not only more frequent, but much larger, much more intense, and they're spreading faster. So they're using tactics that they've used in California and the Mediterranean for some time. Uh, and amongst those are uh, fighting fire with fire. And we've watched as they, they use dripping wicks to spread petrol and diesel uh, over the ground, in effect, as a controlled burn ahead of the main fire, trying to create a fire break so the flames can't leap over that into areas that they are trying to protect. It's quite a big change in the tactics but it's something that they're now having to consider and here in South Wales they've been holding a training course so that other fire services can see how they're dealing uh, with these fires and of course there's nothing better than than seeing a fire for real and that's the real interest today seeing how they're using tactical burns using a helicopter to drop water uh, on flames uh, which are difficult to reach because of the steepness of the slope and again trying to essentially box in the flames uh, and that's the way that as we look forward with increasingly uh, dry spells, these drought spells, that, that they're likely to be dealing on a much greater frequency of wildfires in the future. Ten years ago, King Charles, then Prince Charles, launched the Coronation Meadows project. It was an effort to mark his mother's diamond jubilee to put a wildflower meadow in every county of England. Now, ten years on, it's been a spectacular success we went to see one in Essex that's bloomed on top of a landfill. We're at Langdon Nature Discovery Park in a meadow called Rough Peace, which is our coronation meadow. Back in 2013, when the Queen had been on the throne for 60 years, it was thought to be a really nice idea for conservation across the country to recognise 60 really important meadows, one for each year of her reign. So this was, this was done working with King Charles, as he is now. One of the great things with traditional wildflower meadow like this is that you have flowers available from March time all the way through to September or October. So there's a provision of food for insects across the whole of the growing season. We've lost 97% of our wild flower meadows since the 1930s. And wildflower meadows, of course, are important for their botanical value, but also that, that botanical value that is so important for so many other species. It's a reclaimed uh, landfill site. It's been taking London's waste since about 1930. It was capped off in 2010. We've been working to restore it for the benefit of nature. So 2014, the donor crop came across and there's been a, a massive success in the variety and the strength of the species that we have in front of us. Something like 40 odd species came across in 2014 and at our latest count, we now have between 70 and 80 different species in the site as well. Just behind me is the London Gateway port, DP World. So to find this, this patch of wilderness, this wild area, is just brilliant. Well, that's it for now. Remember, you can get all your climate and environment news on the Sky News website and app or by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. We'll be back next week when we'll be asking some provocative questions about electric cars. See you then.